Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to start there in verse 12. Left off with 11, we'll finish the chapter here today. It says, Therefore rejoice, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, uh, uh, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do, we do love you. We thank you for your word, and we ask for your blessing in our service tonight. Lord, we, we know we certainly do need your touch and your help. Lord, may the truth of your word be clear. May you give us understanding. May it help us in our daily walk with you and draw us closer to you. I pray, Lord, you meet the needs that are in this room. Lord, those, whether it's reproving, rebuking, exhorting, or uh, whatever might be going on, Lord, we certainly pray for you to work. Lord, so please bless and use the service tonight again to increase our knowledge of you and help us draw closer to you. If there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, we certainly do pray for their salvation. Again, Lord, I love you, and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, of course, we've been here in chapter 12 and looking at this, literally, what is the war of wars that has been taking place since the Garden of Eden. A very real war, a spiritual war that takes place between God and the opposition being led of the devil himself and his fallen angels. And uh, again, it's been going on for more than 6,000 years, continuing to this day. And Revelation chapter 12 really gives us a panorama of all of it, from the very beginning to the very end. And it focuses in on how this war ends what's going to take place, um, how the Lord does, in fact, win this war. And again, this war, is, it's been enormous over, over the thousands of years here. It's called more casualties, of course, and more destruction than any other uh, of all the other wars combined easily. But again, this war is coming to an end, and we know who wins it. And we see here in this chapter that we see really Satan at, at its zenith, uh, 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 the war coming to the zenith, its climax of the greatest battles that takes place in it. And, uh, and we're going to see today how Satan literally goes on his largest and most massive attack against the people of God. He will lose, but there certainly will be great suffering as a result. Again, Satan, as we saw last week, is a great deceiver. Two, two areas that it focused on, and that's true throughout the Bible, his ability to deceive and his ability to accuse. He's an accuser and he's a deceiver. Um, and he's been deceiving the world for, you know, since Eve when he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's great at deception. He's deceived the world into thinking that the people of God are even dangerous. I mean, think of it. I, I've read articles where the world is literally afraid of if you're a homeschooling parent who keeps their kids in church, watch out. That's just crazy. That's deception right there. So he's done a good job at deceiving the world that thinking Christians who are really sold out and serving God are actually dangerous to society. It's a deception of Satan. He deceives the world into believing not only that believers are dangerous, but he also deceives them, uh, the world into thinking that, that we're deluded as well. You know, actually believing that the Bible is true. I mean, he has the world believing that we're under some type of delusion because we believe things like creation that takes place in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Or we believe in the flood that we see in Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7. And, and, and of course, uh, the, the world sees this. Again, the devil believes in that we're, we're believing some type of mass delusion. I remember when I was on a, on a, on a boat over, heading over on a supply run in New Guinea. And I had a man from China sit down next to me who had never been in a church service in his life. It was one of those divine appointments that the Lord takes somebody that grew up in this, well, a fairly small place for China, but it was well over a million, the town that he grew up in. And well-educated, master's degree, spoke English very well, happened to be in the country for a few months, and ends up sitting next to me in a little banana boat for the next several hours. 
And he was under that same delusion that the Bible is full of fairy tales, and he brought that up initially just laughing about it. He brought up Noah's Ark was the first thing he brought up. How could I possibly believe that? And so I said, well, let's talk about that a little bit. And so we talked for the next several hours all the way till we got to the, that next island. And then when we got to the next island, there's not like a little dock. You just literally step off into the ocean and walk up onto the shore. And, and we walk up there, and he still wanted to hear more. And so he stood there. We stood there for quite a while longer while he was still hearing more. So we went through, literally went through Genesis. I was giving a summary of what the Bible actually was about, everything tying into salvation and going through the gospel by the time we got to the beach. And he listened. And by the time we were done, it was no longer a book of fairy tales to him. He was beginning to see, I think I've been deceived, which he was. There's a whole lot of truth, and there's not a whole, it is truth in the Bible. There's just not a whole lot of truth in it. It is truth. But the devil's good at that, getting the world to believe that Christians are actually dangerous, getting the world to believe that we're actually deluded. Even in the Great Tribulation, he's going to use deception. He has to use deception a great deal because he's actually going to get the world to try and mount an attack against Jesus Christ himself. Foolish. All deception. And we can think about what's going on at the earth at this time during the Great Tribulation. Really, it is, as we read in our, in our text, think about this. Not only is the world dealing with the attacks, the, the judgments of God between the seals, the trumpets, and the vials, but at the exact same time, Satan is unleashing his greatest fury and his greatest attacks that the world has also seen simultaneously. The devil's attacks are not associated with the seals, trumpets, or vials. Those are of God's judgments on the earth. The devil has his own attacks taking place on the earth at the exact same time. So it really is such a, such a great time of tribulation, as the Bible says. God's attacks, are, of course, many times when he does judge, we see that throughout Scripture, is always designed. We can even see in the book of Revelation with the angel that he has actually proclaiming the gospel in the sky, wanting people to lead to repentance. God's goal with his judgments is to lead people to a point of repentance. The devil's is simply to lead to destruction. <clears throat> we saw last time when we were in this chapter... We are introduced to the characters in the first portion of chapter 12, and we talked about that with Jesus Christ, the woman being Israel, and, and, and the devil. And then we looked at a war that took place actually in heaven. And the Lord allows it to take place. It's a real war where Satan and his fallen angels are finally completely banished from heaven. They had access to heaven even from the time of the fall on. That was part of his accusations. It was part of, of, his, uh, of, of what he was doing for the last 6,000 years, but that ends. We're not exactly sure, as I mentioned last week, when that took place. We know it had to take place prior to the three and a half years when he's cast out because that's when you're going to see the great wrath really hit. So somewhere between the rapture and before the three and a half years, He's cast out of heaven. That war takes place. We looked at some, some really good people believe that that, that that war takes place when the rapture hits. That Satan with his demons, being the prince of the power of the air, tries to hinder the rapture. Which is why we hear the voice of the archangel in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We try to establish that every time you hear that, there's always a battle taking place. It's him and Satan many times. So, it, it's, it, we have no idea if it's true or not. But the, the idea is, the fact that we're hearing the voice of the archangel take place, that there is some type of battle that's happening. So some say they believe that that allows Satan the three and a half years to, to, uh, to uh, um, organize, to put his infrastructure together, everything for the mass attacks that hit after three and a half years. We don't know if that's the case. We just know it had to happen sometime in that window. And so he was thrown out of heaven. And now we're going to see what takes place really from that midpoint on. Again, Revelation chapter 12 is almost a tribulation from Satan's point of view what he's doing at it. It's a parenthetical chapter as we're going through this. It's giving the extra information. And so now we're going to look at what he is doing once he is cast out, what he does. And we're going to see there's basically three parts, three attacks that it tells us of specifically that are going to take place. And we're going to look at those attacks and God's response to those attacks when he unleashes his fury. So first off, back in verse 13, let's look at the first part of his attack. It says, when the dragon, which we already know is established, is Satan. When the dragon that was cast into the earth, remember at that time he is no longer the prince of the power of the air. God has now bound him 
to the earth. That's where he's at. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. We've already established it's easy by even just reading that statement alone, but from earlier in chapter 12, we know that that is dealing with the, with the nation of Israel. This is not dealing with Mary. This is dealing with the, na- the nation of Israel. So as soon as he's ca- when he is cast out, he is going to be going after Israel like never before. Israel has always suffered the attacks of Satan. He knows they're God's chosen people, and Satan has went after them really since the call of Abraham. He has went hard after them. Um, I mean, think of Israel. Israel, time and time again, not only have they been judged of God when they've been disobedient, but they also, too, have put up with the attacks of Satan over the thousands of years. Again, but God's goal was always repentance. Satan's goal was always to destroy them. Now, we even know in, in, within, we still have some alive even, even to this day who are alive during the Holocaust that took place. I just read a story of a, a lady who was... Uh, was part of, in one of the camps there in Germany, um, or one of the prisoners in one of the camps um, who was just severely beaten. So they're still alive even to this day. But we know, we know of, of Satan's attempt even then to try and destroy the nation of Israel with the killing of millions of Jews then. So we have seen the evidence of this persecution in our lifetime. However, what they are going to face during this time is by far the worst ever. Nothing else will compare to what they're going to have to put up with during the Great Tribulation. They were going to face the entire fury of Satan. It's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 as Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 24 and 21 lets us know that this, this time of trouble and tribulation will not be such as not occurred since the beginning of the world. There will be no other time, no other amount of persecution and suffering taking place, and this is dealing again with Satan's fury going after them, that the world has ever seen. Remember what he's going to have at his hand as the tribulation goes on. He's going to start off with just the original demons that he's in control of. But as time goes on through tribulation, those that have been bound in hell are going to be released. He's going to have power over those. He's going to have authority over those. The the 200 million, for whatever reason, were held in the Euphrates River that we looked at. He's going to have those as well. The demonic activity on the earth is going to be enormous. And, he's going, when he, and all his efforts are going, to be, are going to be directed at the nation of Israel still trying to stop the kingdom from coming. If he can just eliminate all of them, he wants to thwart God's plan. And so he's going to go after the nation of Israel. Satan will go after Israel with everything that he has, and he has a lot at his disposal. We already see from the book of Daniel, he has the world's government's He's in control of those. So he'll be able to use the world's governments for this attack against Israel. He also has a blinded world that he can use at his disposal on these attacks. And, of course, all of the demons that are under his authority. But we see what happens in verse 14. He goes after Israel, but look what the Lord does. And we're dealing now with after the three and a half year time frame. The devil knows he has a short time when he's cast down, so he has the great wrath. He knows what's coming for himself. <clears throat> it says, And when the dragon was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of great e- uh, two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. So we see the devil's attack. But right after that, we see God's intervention again with the nation of Israel. Time and time again throughout all of world history, you see God intervening in the nation of Israel. We have seen it in our lifetime, time and time again, where the Lord has intervened for the nation of Israel. He's going to do it in the most uh, amazing way um, during the Great Tribulation, as we're seeing right now in this verse. We see first, He's going to protect with provision. It says here that God is going to be using these wings of an eagle to give uh, Israel the ability to flee from Satan's attack. So no doubt, I I believe a lot of the concentration initial attacks are going to take place in Jerusalem, in, in Israel itself. So they're going to have to get out of there. They're not going to be able to stay in Israel when this begins. They're going to have to leave. The Bible refers to them, again, receiving the wings of an eagle and heading to the wilderness. This is not the first time in Scripture that we see such wording. Uh, we see it, for instance, look over in Exodus chapter 19. This is dealing when God delivered them. Let me see if I have the right verse here. Yes. 
Yes. Verse 4, referring to God delivering His people from Egypt. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. So it's, it's similar terminology that we have in Scripture is used here once again in the book of Revelation. Some people say, well, this means, this means God's going to use airplanes. I actually listened to a sermon years ago about a, a guy demonstrating that the Lord is going to use an airplane, that this is what this is referring to. It does not have to refer to an airplane. It's referring to God's divine intervention when they do flee Israel, that God will intervene to help protect them so that they will not be destroyed. Now, whatever means you have to leave, I don't know. That really doesn't matter. It wasn't like back in the book of Exodus that they all got on El Tel Aviv Airlines and got out of Israel, all right? Um, so it deals with God's protection. It's the same terminology we have. A lot of metaphors are used in this chapter. So they are going to be able to escape. They're going to head out. And it says to the wilderness. This is, of course, what we see take place. Exodus 15, 22. I won't turn there for time's sake. Time is really moving on me. It's already 20 till. I've only got an hour left of this message. Uh, where they fled to, where, when they left Egypt, where did they flee to? When God, to the wilderness. Which the wilderness was, was prior to God, the promised land. There's so many similarities, which is going to take place in the great tribulation, that we do see with the exodus that takes place when they left Egypt. So God is now going to take them to a place of wilderness. We don't know what this is, but it simply is a place of God's protection. But they're certainly going to have to get out of Israel. There's certainly an exodus that is going to have to take place when the persecution begins. This is what this is telling us. But they're going to have God's protection as they travel, and God has a place that is prepared for them that the devil's not going to be able to touch them. We have no idea where this place is. There's many guesses. Uh, most, most people like to guess is a place called Petra, which is in... It better be in Jordan. I believe that's in the country of Jordan. And a place called Petra. It's a, basically, a, it's, a, it's a fairly popular tourist, tourist attraction even to this day. It's, it's a, basically a city out of stone. Very, it'd be very hard to attack it. Even some Christians who actually, that's the place. They have went there and hid Bibles throughout Petra, believing that's the place God's going to send them. But God isn't limited to such a place like Petra. It certainly, I mean, it could be there. I don't know where it is. But he has a place prepared for their protection. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a, a stone city. If he chooses to use that, so be it. We don't know where it's going to be, but we know that God has prepared a place in the wilderness to uh, keep Israel protected. Satan will try and try to get to them, even, on, even as they depart out, but God will miraculously intervene uh, in the nation of Israel. So God will also feed them. He's going to nourish them. Uh, it's dealing with the same word as feeding. He's going to protect them. He, we've seen him do it when they were in the wilderness before. What did God use? Use manna from heaven. It doesn't say he's going to use manna, but he certainly could do that again. So their provisions are going to be met. They're going to be supplied for while they're fleeing this mass persecution that takes place. God will meet their needs. He will protect them. And the fact is, Satan will not succeed in his efforts to destroy the nation of Israel. It's not going to take place. We even know from Scripture, I believe, that Gentiles are going to help them. I need to turn here for time. I know I don't have a whole lot of time tonight, but I do want you to see this. There's so much confusion over this. Let's go to Matthew 25. We're going to be there in our series in Matthew here shortly, probably maybe February or March time frame. We're going to be here. Let, let me just mention it here briefly because I think it's important. There's a judgment that's going to take place when Jesus Christ returns to the earth called the sheep and the goats. This is a, a particular judgment. It's not dealing with our judgment seat of Christ, nor is it dealing with the judgment that takes place called the great right throne of judgment. This is a separate judgment that takes place for those who are still alive when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And so we see here starting in verse 41. Let's see if I should back up earlier. It, it starts earlier than this. Um, uh, let me go to verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So they're going into the kingdom, which is now going to be established on the earth. All right. For I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Uh, and then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered 
and fed thee, thirsty and gave thee drink. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison or came unto thee? And the king answered, answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall I say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hunger, and you gave me no meat. And, and it goes on, where they did not take him in as a stranger. They did not visit, was in prison. And the idea here is this, when this judgment takes place when Christ returns, he has to do something with all those who are still alive. Who's going into the kingdom time frame and who is not? This is the beginning of the millennial reign. And so the basis of who's still going to be entering in and staying on the earth deals with how they treated Israel during this mass persecution, Christ brethren. And I, I, and I completely believe, for other reasons I'm not going to get into now for time's sake, it's already 845, and I haven't finished my first of a five-point message. Um, I, 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 what, I'm on my second. See, I actually, I got to my second point already. I didn't even know that. I got to my second point. Um, and now I've lost all my train of thought. We might as well just close in prayer now. I'm done now. <laughs> um, um, I have no idea what I was saying. Um, yeah, yes, he was going to be going in at that time. And so he's going to be judging them based on how they treated Israel. And I believe completely that those who are going in are also the Gentiles who had put their faith in Jesus Christ. I believe every single one of them are those. I believe that's why they were taking care of Israel. Because you already have the mark of the beast. You have such great deception taking place. I believe I can easily make an argument that the Gentiles here are those who made a decision for Jesus Christ. And so with that, it's interesting to say, I mean, I can't be too dogmatic on it because I don't have it quite set on that, but I believe I can make a, a decent apologetic argument for what I'm saying, that that means that everybody in the kingdom initially is saved. It's going to be the offspring from those who are going to be the first ones to have to make a decision still for Christ, and not all of those will, which is just amazing because Christ is going to be ruling and reigning on the earth. He's going to be right there. So anyhow... Um, let me move on here. Now, the time frame is also given in that verse. It's speaking of a three and a half year time frame. We have that established in the book of Daniel. Time, time, times, and a half. That's three and a half years. All right, Daniel chapter 12. You can, you can go over there and take a look at that. It's a three and a half year time frame. So it's dealing from the midpoint on is what it's focusing on for the great persecution that's going to take place that Satan is going to do. Now, I can move on very quickly with the other points. The first two were the largest of the points, so let me cover these. He goes on to a second attack, though. Look at verse 15. He's still trying to get to them, and God is protecting them, even on the journey out, but he's not done yet. They're in their place where God is trying to protect them, and Satan goes another route now. <clears throat> this flood. It says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So Satan does another attack here against him. He tries another way to try and destroy the nation of Israel. Um, and and but once again, the Lord is going to intervene. We're going to see that here in just, a sec in, in, in just a second. He uses this flood. Now, most likely, we're not dealing with an actual flood of water, since metaphors are used throughout this verse and throughout this chapter. So do we have any other place in Scripture where we can see where flood was used as a metaphor? And we do. For time's sake, I'm not going to turn there. I was in Jeremiah 47.2. It's describing an army destroying the Philistines as a flood over compassing them. David uses it also in Psalm 124, 1 through 8, when he was about to be overcome of his enemies in battle, he described it as a flood that was coming at him. So I don't know exactly what the flood's going to be. It's obviously dealing with a mass something going at the nation of Israel, but it's very likely we could be referring to an army's approaching where they're protected, that Satan tries to gather up an army and try to intervene. Something's going to take place where it's on a grand scale uh, equivalent to a mass flood that is approaching, all right? That's, that's what it's dealing with. So let me go on to point number four. We see the second attack, which is through the flood. Point number four, God protects now, not with provision, but with power. Verse 16, it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And so once again, God intervenes. This is something that certainly had the capability to destroy the nation of Israel, but God miraculously and divinely intervenes for their protection. The earth opens up and swallows them, it says. Um, and, of course, we see some similar things to wording used. For instance, Exodus chapter 15 with the Red Sea and God swallowing up uh, uh, the Egyptian army in the Red Sea when the waters overtook them. 
Um, we have that wording. We have, we have other wording as well. We can think of Numbers chapter 16. For time's sake, we're not going to turn there. But Numbers chapter 16, 28 through 32. Korah, Dathan, um, Abraham, when, when the, literally the earth opened up and swallowed them. We also know Revelation is a time of great, there's going to be three of the greatest earthquakes the world has ever seen take place. So could this be an army that's approaching and literally the earth opens up through a massive earthquake and destroys the army? That's a possibility. We, we, simply knows it, we simply do know that it means that God will divinely protect them. Whatever this flood is that he's throwing at the nation of Israel in another type of attack, it won't work. It will not take. God will intervene and he will protect them. Now we have a great lesson for us here that I do want to get to. We see something very important for us. That even when a situation looks hopeless, there is always hope with God. I mean, you think of everything the nation of Israel is facing at this time. And by the way, I do believe it's during this time of God's protection that, that and we can lay that out from Scripture, that many of them, many of them are realizing that their Messiah is in fact Jesus Christ. I believe the amount of conversions taking place for the nation of Israel are enormous during this time. So, the entire world is basically after them. But we need to learn a phrase. We, we, we've heard different you know, sayings of it before, but there's, there certainly is a truth to it. But God. Even though they're undergoing all this, but God. Even though it looked like they could be destroyed right in their own nation. When the one who controls the world's governments has hundreds of millions of demons at his disposal, basically a blinded world at his, at his disposal that he could lead to be murderous at any moment. The fact is, but God. And he protects. When you're facing a horrible situation, but God. When you're facing uh, you know, a sickness, all of a sudden you get that call about cancer. Remember, but God. When you don't know what to do, but God. Remember him. When you think there is no hope, there certainly is, because God is there. When you think there is no answer, but God. Even when the devil himself is raging against you, God is not limited. So we see God protects. So then we see the third element of Satan's attack, and we'll finish up with this. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He has to change gears with the attack now. He realizes God's omnipotence, God's divine protection of what's taking place with the nation of Israel. So he switches gears. And I believe this is also evidence of a lot of this taking place where he probably fell a fairly good amount of time before the three and a half years because of the fifth seal and the martyrs that are in heaven. Because now he's going after... Anybody that names Christ. I mean, he always has, but this is at a different level now. I think he tries to go after the 144,000 that are going around preaching. It's going to be useless. They're sealed and protected of God as well. But those who put their faith in Christ during this time are not. The many multitudes of them, multitudes upon multitudes, will be martyred for their faith. Satan will go after them with great power. It, it can even be referring to the two witnesses, the Gentile believers who come to Christ. He changes gears to try and go after however he can to try and thwart God's plan. But the fact is, when we ask the question, will Satan win against God? Absolutely not. It's not even close. It's not even close. The fact is, if he puts God's people in prison, what happens? They usually send them to the Lord and their jailers get converted. If he decides he's going to torture them, well, they become partakers of Christ's suffering and heirs to great reward. And then if he decides to martyr them, they're in the presence of Jesus Christ. He has no avenue at winning this battle. None. And he knows it. But when this time hits with this war, and the war will be over, at the conclusion of that three and a half years, the battle's over. The war of wars ends. Satan is bound for the next thousand years. It's done with. It's done with. So we know who wins in the end, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to remember the same principle we see in Revelation is true in our life, even though we don't have to put up to, to such a grand scale of tribulation like we'll be during that time. 
the Lord is always there for us. Just like he promised in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, you know, uh, um, how he will never leave us nor forsake us.